So we've talked a little bit about kids and social and products and learning and play. And now we're going to dive into parenting those kids that use that technology. And I have the honor to introduce to our stage Julie Jargon, the columnist of the Wall Street Journal. If you don't read her family tech column that she writes Tuesdays or Thursdays? Tuesdays. Tuesdays. You need to. And I guess I just need to give a little plug to LinkedIn because <laughs> I've been reading Julie's column since April when she launched. And I was telling Robin Raskin, our founder, I said, Robin, if there's one person I want to do an interview on our stage, I want it to be Julie. She understands parents. She understands the struggle and the joy. And I'm going to leave it to her to introduce Chris. Great. Thank you. So I've got here with me Chris Hulls, co-founder and CEO of Life360. And we're going to talk a little bit about his company and the broader space of uh, keeping tabs on children in real life and digitally. So Chris, when people come to you, parents, to sign up for Life360, what is their motivation for doing so? Is it fear about the safety of their children? What is it? I think they generally just want peace of mind and they hear from other parents uh, about how useful this app is. And if you talk to any family, the same set of problems are pretty consistent. My life is stressful, it's chaotic, and I just want to get through the day. Um, so that is really the high level. Um, what are the real dangers that parents are facing or, or perceiving that they are facing when it comes to the safety of their children? I think it's a fewfold. First, I apologize to the audience. I'm uh, recovering from a very sore throat, which I'm going to use to my advantage when she gets to the harder questions. Um, uh, but I would say, somewhat sarcastically, the biggest uh, safety point is that dad not picking up the kids from soccer practice. So although we are solving life-saving problems like someone getting in a car crash, so much of what we hear from the users who use our product day to day is these really mundane things. And it's less of a, a specific fear around one, any type of bad thing is just being able to know that if I need to help my family or just coordinate, I can find them immediately with Life360. Okay. When it comes to the bigger picture dangers, because I know as parents we hear horror stories in the news and it makes us fear for the safety of our children. Um, but in many ways, kids seem to be safer than ever these days. Yep. You know, if you look at the number of abductions from strangers, that's gone way down. Um, and at the same time, kids are also under the watch of their parents more than ever. Do you feel that there might be a correlation between the two? I don't think so. Uh, I think the world is getting safer because poverty is going down, incomes are going up. This is, in general, a safer place. Uh, but technology shines a spotlight much more in these areas than it was in the past when we weren't connected to everyone all the time. And with that constant connectivity um, comes a lot of privacy questions, um, not only data privacy, but in terms of teenagers just being teenagers. So what right do you feel kids and teenagers have to privacy and to not being monitored by their parents? We think it's a family decision. Um, there have been many tools to help families stay connected probably through the dawn of time. I remember pay phones when I was a little kid, then cell phones, and we had the same concerns that cell phones could be a way of always being in touch. And at some point, yeah, you can cross the line, but from a Life360 standpoint, our product is completely opt-in. We don't let you lock down your kids' phones. It's that conversation you have. Yeah, and I think that's a concern of some people that um, parents might rely too much on technology and uh, as a parenting tool instead of having conversations with kids. So whether parents are tracking their kids' grades online or their whereabouts or their social media posting and activity, that that can sometimes replace the conversations parents should be having with their children. What are your thoughts on that? Tech has jumped the shark in the sense that like it's happened, like it's old news, it's here, it's not going away. We use tech in everything. So it's really what, how, how we interact with it. Um, TV is great, we all have TV, but we all know about the cliche of putting your kids down in front of a TV and not pairing them. And it is very similar. So as the market leader in our space around location sharing, the things we're doing, we do have an advisory panel now of uh, parents and experts who are helping us come with content to help you understand the limits of tech, to help you with Life360 context that having location sharing with your family is actually a way of giving them more freedom because you can resist that urge to keep it um, 
to keep them always within arm's reach. So it can actually be used as a way to give more freedom. And then when you do go to that extreme, we've had 25 million plus active users now, sometimes parents can go too far. So one thing we've committed to do by the end of the year is having a 24-7 a hotline where if Life360 or any tech tool is being used in a way that does cross that line, possibly to abuse, that we will help you, whether it be calling the police or child protective services. So that's part of what we're doing as the, as the, the leaders in the category today. So that seems a little unusual for a tech company to take that more proactive role in, in responding to concerns that people have and, and taking a, a role. Um, yeah, we, we don't want to be glib about it. We're, we're blessed with the success we've had in being so big. And although we're, we're convinced, we see the data, we know how people use the product, that it's not going to be a big issue. Out of millions and millions of people, there will be times where we do think it is important that we're, we're good stewards of this position we're in. And so with Apple and Google creating better parental controls and more options within the devices themselves to do the things you're doing, how do you stay relevant and innovate to stay ahead of that? So what we think, if we go more abstract, is that the family is one of the most important networks, if not the most important network in your life. And the focus around building tools for a very specific audience will trump out the more generic options. So there's already Find My Friends and Google Maps and all these location sharing services, but we're already building things that differentiate us on top of it. Find My Friends is not going to help you have your kids being a safer driver. It's not going to help tell you if someone's been in a car accident. We're not going to have these, the same features for a tight-knit group of three or four people, whereas we are. So the analogy we like to give is, um, is the car analogy. Like, is a Ferrari competing with a minivan? Because you could take a Ferrari to the grocery store to get your groceries, but it's really not practical. But if you're a mom with two kids and a dog, you want three rows of seats and 19 cup holders and sliding doors. So that's really what we're building. So if you believe our thesis that family is an important enough unit, that something that specifically for you makes sense, we think that's more than enough to stay ahead of a more generic platform. So for those in the audience who might not realize that you have this auto tracking feature, can you explain what that does? Sure, so our, our vision, the reason we're called Life360 is we, we do want this 360 degree protection for you as a person, your physical safety, you in the car, you in the home, you in the cloud. So our first new product in the physical safety realm was protecting you in the car. So we, with a service called Driver Protect, for eight bucks a month, you get uh, automatic crash detection response, which is essentially what um, OnStar did 20 years ago, but built into the car. We're doing roadside assistance, just like you give AAA, and then also reports that tell you how your family members are driving. So are they speeding? Are they texting? It actually becomes kind of a fun game. And we do it very inexpensively because it's all in software. There's no new hardware, which is part of, part of the whole software in the world mantra that we're a part of being built into the phone. Um, so that's now uh, the vast majority of our revenue will uh, be on track to go over $100 million run rate next year um, as we do launch these new sets of services. Um, and one very cool stat now is that we are sending an ambulance to a real accident at least once every hour now. Um, and it's on a multiple time a week basis, we're getting very heartfelt notes that my child would have died if it weren't for your app. So car accident on a country road at night, no one saw the accident, they were knocked unconscious and we were able to detect it and get them the help they needed. How do you stay on top of all of the new operating system upgrades that Apple and Google um, do? Lots of people and lots of money. Um, uh, it is really hard. Uh, and I know when mobile first came out, there's the, the theme that things are getting easier and cheaper to build with software. I think it's not going the other way as we get fragmentation in operating systems and devices. It becomes a real overhead, and that's why you are seeing consolidation to a few or bigger players, and I think we're now in that realm where we probably have, we're spending the tens of millions of dollars a year just staying on top of all that. It's painful. Got it, got it. I know we talk a lot about parents keeping tabs on their kids, but obviously, uh, just beyond Life360, kids and teenagers are sharing their location information, yep. and they're spending data on Venmo and what have you um, all the time, openly. And when I've talked to young people about this, they say that they understand that they're giving up a degree of privacy in exchange for convenience or something that's fun. Um, talk about the trade-offs that people are making now when it comes to their own personal privacy. Sure. So I think 99.9% .9 of people do not think about it. Um, there's a selection bias for people in this room. We're all very aware about tech. We're in the industry. Uh, a there are probably many stereotypes that apply to most of the people here. 
what we see from our user base, we have thousands and thousands of inbound emails and phone calls a week. I think uh, right before this, we, we did a quick check. How many people have asked us about CCPA in the last week? And the answer was two. Um, so most people don't think about it. So our, our view as a company is it's on us to A, follow the law, B, make ethical decisions, and then give users choice. Although we know most people aren't going to think about that choice. In my personal view is that a lot of the privacy risks are overblown. And there's just a, a natural discomfort that people didn't grow up with this have around their data being out there. But this is, I mean, the entire Google business model is built on knowing everything you do and what you search for. There are older companies like the, the credit bureaus, like Equifax and all that. They know everything, social security numbers, your job, your income, much more sensitive. So I think a lot of the anxiety is more around the unknown about the hypothetical risks versus things that have actually happened. What are the biggest risks? Like, what should we be worried about? I think it's more legislative in the sense that, um, so we, we track how you drive and we want to give new features to our users based on how you drive. And so if you think you're a good driver and you want to have a better insurance rate because of your driving behavior, you should let us do that. I think it's more on the, the government to say there are certain red lines in the sand that, we, that people just can't cross because even if they are, um, even if they want to opt in, they shouldn't. Like you're not allowed to sell your kidney because the government, we as a society have decided that, that even if you want to do that, you shouldn't be able to do it. So there's probably some stuff around DNA testing. Um, it's probably good that insurers can't discriminate against you based on your DNA. There probably are things that we need to do with data we collect, like location, where it doesn't become a proxy for racial discrimination. So I think those are the types of things that are important. Um, and probably some set of guidelines that, that has a level playing field we can all understand that's user readable. I, I do worry that some of the things out there like GDPR, they had good intentions, but they've become, from a practical standpoint, just more legalese that no one clicks through. So what are the simple ways that we can get a good set of guidelines that's respected worldwide? Okay. So what are some things that you as a, as a tech company can do to ensure not only the safety and security of people's data and information, but to ensure that their privacy is not eroded? Sure, so with us, uh, we have all the standard bank level security that is beyond my technical pay grade, but we make sure to do it. We do penetration tests and all that, and given the sensitivity of the data we have, it's just a, part, a core part of what we do, and it's a, a tax, so to speak, that we pay just a, in terms of our burn and, and resources to make sure we stay ahead of that. We also do a lot to give users choice. So some companies are a little bit sneaky and hide things in privacy policies. They might not even be doing it intentionally, but our thought was, even though we know it's a minority of people who do take the interest in understanding what we do, we want to be transparent and we do want to give them control. So we do have a privacy center where you can go and we explain exactly how we secure and how we use your data in plain English and we let you opt in or opt out to different things. We try to build the product in a way that you can opt out of everything and it will still function. We do have some third-party partnerships that has to, we just need it but we explain what will break, and we don't require you to be in any of our data programs if you don't want to. And then we also, we start internally when we do a new partnership, when we do anything with our data, we just put on our own personal opinion hats and say, are, are, can we go home at night and sleep well with what we're doing? And, and we very, yes, we can. And that is just something that guides our product decisions. How can parents explain to their children who are growing up with all of this, what they should be concerned about, what they should be thinking about when they download apps, when they share their information? What I, can parents do? I actually don't think the parents need to do nearly as much as we think. I think there's a, a misconception that Gen Y and the millennials are the same. The millennials, of which I'm an older one, we sort of were in this gray zone where we were pre-social media, and then I remember I was in college, people were just reckless with everything they posted. The younger kids kind of get it. They're growing up with this, which also means they know the constraints. That's probably why products like Snapchat did well with this younger generation, because it's ephemeral by nature. Um, so I, I think the, the younger kid is now 16 and under. This is the world they grew up in. They know more than the parents, and they're a lot smarter about it. So I think it's, I'm being a little glib there. So I, I think the parenting is more around, I think it's actually more around like, hey, the, interact with real people, your life is not the number of likes you get, but in terms of awareness around data and security and being smart, I think they're ahead. Okay. Are we being? <laughs> yeah, you are good. 
Are we running out of time? Okay. <laughs> do, you, do you do you have you want to finish up? I just I think just one final question is where you feel all of this is heading in terms of the um, monitoring of our our children and um, ourselves. Are we going to become eventually more like China, where it's kind of a, a normal state of affairs to you know, there's no expectation of privacy anymore? I think we're, our, our country is very different than in China, um, although I think a lot of people are worried with how things have been shaping up. Um, the right to independence and privacy is fundamental in who we are, so I think technology is going to continue to evolve, uh, but how we use it might be very different, and I think that is something that we as citizens and parents need to be very aware of, but the way to solve that is not by going backwards, because I'm I think we can all agree we're not going back to a world of no smartphones and cameras and microphones. Um, technology goes forward and then we have to adapt to it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Julie. I really appreciate it.